Good morning. I'm your friendly neighborhood supply priest from Middletown. Uh, my name is Hank Galganowitz. I have been here before, so some of you have, have seen me, and I remember some of your names. Uh, so we're beginning with uh, Rite 2, as found in either in your prayer book or the booklet. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you promise, make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> First lesson, a reading from the first book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 7 through 9. Thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth. Among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor, together. A great company, they shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water, in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then were we like those who dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad in Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the watercourses of the Negev. who sowed with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, will come again with joy, shouldering their sheaves. The Lord has done great The second reading, a reading from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 7, verses 23 through 28. The former priests were many in number, because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But Jesus holds his priesthood permanently, because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he has no need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins, and then for those of the people. This he did once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests those who are subject to weakness. But the word of oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Christ. Jesus and his disciples came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. 
When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. So, throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So there's an awful lot at play in today's gospel reading. Traditionally, uh, as you might know, the healing of blind Bartimaeus is characterized as a healing story, or a miracle story, rather. Uh, the story being that Jesus healed a blind beggar but there are nuances. One of them, for example, is that if you study uh, history of the time uh, and you research what was going on then, you will discover that Jesus was not the only healer. He was one among many. Another nuance is that, for example, today, most liberal scholars would say that Stories like these miracle stories are mythical. And just so you know up front, I lean in that direction. In which case, the question of whether what is described actually happened is less relevant than other questions like, what does it mean? What is it the author is trying to tell us? Or, in some instances, trying to sell us because they were good at that, too. However, so now I, I put, you know, sort of the mythical emphasis, right? However, my wife and I are both Reiki practitioners. Anybody know what that is? No hands. Oh, one hand. Basically, it's laying on of hands with a Japanese name. I'll explain it sometime later, okay? It's a, a whole separate healing practice, like healing touch, if anybody's knows nurses or is aware of that sort of thing, it's very similar to that. So anyway, she and I are both uh, Reiki practitioners, and I can tell you, despite my leaning in the mythical direction about a lot of these biblical stories, we have seen some things that really approach this story as it's told. And you kind of walk away and go, hmm, you know, I had nothing to do with that, but here's what happened. And there are scholars today who are speaking out loud again about the reality of something like the paranormal or the super and or, not or, not one or the other, and or the supernatural. Uh, so if you take those to some kind of heart and seriousness, you can't just rule out you know, the possibility of physical miracle stories altogether. Now, whether this particular story 
is an actual physical miracle story is another nuance. It's not really clear within the story itself. And you can be reading this as I'm talking if you want. If you look at the story closely, you'll notice that there is no laying on of hands. Jesus never touches Bart. Not in Mark. Matthew changes it, and he has Jesus touch it. Luke rechanges it again, and in Luke he doesn't touch it. But at least in this version, which is probably the first one, Jesus does not touch Bart at all. And according to the story, Jesus says to him, your faith has made you well. Which kind of has the sound uh, of healing being more about Bart's trust than anything specific that Jesus did. And Jesus, you notice, doesn't take any claim or credit, right? Bart responds, and he says, okay, you're good. It has the sound, kind of, you know, mystical stuff, because I like this sort of thing, of the personal experience of the divine presence opening a person to new sight, new vision, birth, health. It kind of smells like that. Blindness versus sight is a recurring theme in the Gospels, most particularly in the Gospel of John, if you know, you've studied these things. And one of the genuinely now mythical aspects of these healing stories is that the authors are intentionally trying to portray Jesus as the Son of God instead of the Emperor. And what I mean by that is, again, if you've studied this or if you know your history, it was the Roman Emperor who was the Son of God. That was on the coins, right? So these authors are trying to take you in another direction if you're the reader and saying, no, 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 not the emperor. It's actually this guy, Jesus, who is this. So they're using truly political, religious polemic, trying to persuade readers, you, that seeing actually means recognizing Jesus, him specifically, not the emperor. They're trying to persuade you that Jesus is Lord, Savior, Son of God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, not the emperor. And as you may remember from Roman times, if you said that out loud in the wrong place, that could get you killed. Physical blindness was often used as a spiritual metaphor. Uh, there was a misperception, a carryover from uh, what could be called Hebrew times, the Old Testament, uh, that suggested that if you were ill, infirm, disabled, that sort of thing, you must have sinned against God. Uh, the entire book of Job is about that argument, right? The trio of supposed friends are trying to convince Job that all these plagues that are being visited upon him must be because he deserves them because he did something wrong. And Job is a smart one who holds out and says, no, that's not it. And at the end, he kind of gets blasted, but he does win out. So Jesus, again, undercuts that perception that somehow, you know, you're physically blind or disabled because you've committed a sin. In Mark's story, twice on this journey to Jericho, Mark's Jesus asks the question, what do you want me to do for you? And what I mean by that is 15 verses earlier before today's, he's tromping around with his groupies, the disciples, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, ask Jesus to do whatever they want for them. Remember that one? And um, he asks them, what do you want me to do for you? And they want him to do a special favor. Let us sit at your left and right hand. Supposedly for their faithfulness. We've been tromping around after you all this time. You know, in your glorified afterlife, uh, let us sit, you know, up front at the table with you. Which immediately should tell you that this is not a story from Jesus, but from the authors, because Jesus never talked about an afterlife. If you've not heard that, look that up sometime. He does not talk about an afterlife. So this is the author trying to sell you that. And the disciples want to be there, and they want their carrot stick reward for having been with them. 
So the disciples, here's the play, who can physically see are spiritually blind. They're ego-driven. They want special treatment. I am the good one, right? Please favor me. Whereas blind Bartimaeus sees spiritually. He is already enlightened, you could argue, because he just wants to see reality. He wants the physical sort of sight recognition of what is. He wants to see Jesus, which is not what the disciples are asking. So the disciples ask for themselves. Bart asks for something else, suggesting who the true disciple is. That's part of the play that Mark is going with. Okay, now here's the real twist that intrigued me. And it's, you know, sometimes these things flow over you. The traditional interpretation of this story and of Jesus' question assumes that Jesus is already the divine magician, right? The one who we think will fix all things if we just pray hard enough. I mean, that's another version of being disabled and you must have sinned, right? You haven't prayed hard enough, so you're not getting whatever it is that you want. That's a whole other ballgame, but, you know. The tone of that question uh, from this kind of Jesus sounds something like this. I'm going to try to give you a different emphasis. What do you want me to do for you? The emphasis being on what? Sort of a tell me and I'll fulfill your wishes. And you notice that the underlying premise here is that the purpose seems to be that Jesus is supposed to give us what we want. That's the assumption. It's what we've been taught a lot of the time, right? It's a little bit like Aladdin's genie, except it's sacred. What if the question was asked differently, different slant, different tone? What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Why are you asking me? What do you think I can do for you? The implication being, I'm not the genie. Hmm. Coupled with Jesus' statement that Bart's faith has made, it is his faith that has made him whole, this opens up kind of a whole new set of doors and windows for the spirit to blow through. And indeed, there is a whole line of both spiritual and psychological thought which teaches that we personally are responsible for removing the obstacles that we place in our way, personally and collectively. We are responsible. So that, I'm, although I'm going to get into this in a little more depth, the quick way to think of it is climate change, racism. What can I do? I don't know, but you personally better get started. Because somebody ain't going to wave their magic wand, whoever they are, astrophysicist or Jesus, and fix it for you. It is a problem. You live here. What are you doing about it? It's that kind of emphasis on personal responsibility and collective. It's not just the individual. It's the old story of you have to remove the splinter from your eye so that you can see clearly. Our job is to remove the splinter. Jesus does the healing. That's a different step two. So the really transformative element in this story is Bart's passionate entreaty to God. I want to see again. He wants to see what's there. He has a desire to see. That's what he's asking for. Which, for people like me, who you know are supposed to play with applying these things, raises the double-edged question. Do we want to see again? And what are we blind to? Now, in the vein of that old adage that the gospel is both supposed to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, this, these questions are going to be about afflicting the comfortable, just so you know up front. Do we want to see the Bible's exclusivistic and patriarchal polemic right from the beginning in the stories of creation? That they were written specifically to undermine women and goddesses, written to undermine Canaanites and so-called pagans, because pagans, of course, are nothing more than anybody that's not us. 
right? Everybody else is a pagan. Are we willing to see that, according to the story, the land that was supposedly given to a set of people by a new god was already occupied by other people with gods, their own gods and goddesses? Has anybody ever looked at that? Are we ready to see, finally, underneath it all, that these are mythological stories, not factual history? These are not reality. Are we ready to see the suffering that the church has wrought upon the world as it joined, then became, the imperial power? and then expanded through the violence, underlying violence, of colonialism, genocide, racism, looting the wealth of nations. That's our church. Once again, the gods and goddesses, ritual sites, ritual practices of non-Christians were systemically destroyed or co-opted. So what we did. In the 4th and 5th centuries, just to make sure that everybody was really pure, if you remember your Christian history, we fought amongst ourselves, arguing about purity versus heresy. That's how we got things like the current creed we use, right? It's not because it's a reality, it's because that's who won. And we exiled and killed each other, all in the name of God. Then there were crusades, inquisitions, Catholic and Protestant wars, some of which are still hanging on, right, depending on where you live. There were indigenous people to subdue all around the world because, my gosh, they were savages, right? So they had to be shown the light because what could they possibly know? Are we ready to finally see the extent of violence underlying our own national history and formation? More colonialism from the old world Doctrines of discovery, I love that one, claiming authority from the Pope to commit more genocide upon Native Americans. It was like, you know, the guy on high was saying, yeah, it's fine, kill these people, it's okay. We, we ignore the love your neighbor as yourself part, but, you know, go ahead. In the name of God, property, and money, upstanding Christian slave traders and owners established slavery and racism. Facilitated by churches. Remember that. It's not like we sat on the sidelines and prayed for everybody's goodness. We were part of it. And now, just as a carryover, because this stuff hasn't stopped, we have boards of ed in certain states that I won't mention, allowing for opposing views to the Holocaust. Do you know anybody, friends, relatives, anybody who was in the Holocaust? What is an opposing view? What does that look like? You're going to have school apps promoting the KKK? You're going to have Hitler hero videos? What is that? How can you even say that? But we've got them. And the favorite American one, you know, so I might as well toss it in as part of the ballgame. In the midst of an epidemic of gun violence, are we finally ready to place our children's health and safety above our adolescent need to play with guns? Don't hide behind the Second Amendment. That's all you're doing. It's a different issue. What's more important? Are we ready to see, do we want to see, that we're on the edge of an apocalypse? Maybe we're already in it. And what apocalypse really means is world views, things that, the way we saw things are coming to an end. It's always been this way, and we're looking at the fact that it ain't going to be this way anymore. Or maybe it already isn't. And that's for better and worse. It works, you know, both ways. Some of those views are already gone. Some we're still fighting to hold on to. Because that idea that it's ending scares us. Some of us want to see these realities come to
to fruition and move toward them. Some of us resist holding on to the way that we've always done it. You know, the church is particularly good about that. We've always done it this way, right? And that's really what the tug of war in our national life is about right now. White Christian nationalism, fundamentalism, rejection of science, Holocaust deniers, those are all splinters. You can argue about them politically, but that's just political argument. There's a reality to those things. And if from a religious standpoint, there are splinters that we are afraid to remove. Because my God, what if I see that? Am I going to bleed to death out of my eye? That's a metaphor, but... We have talked ourselves into believing some very bad stories. Some tragic stories. Some violent stories. Many people, millions of people probably over the course of our time, have suffered from the collective trauma of living in these stories. Frankly, we need new stories. There are a lot of people writing about that right now. At the very least, we need to re-envision the old ones. We've kind of forgotten the love your neighbor part, you know? And we cannot do that until and unless we stop being willfully blind and see the wounds that we have inflicted upon ourselves. You have to take the bandage off. There's a 13th century Sufi mystic whom I like very much, poet, by the name of Rumi, who summarized it this way. Don't turn your head. Keep looking at the bandaged place, the wound because that's where the light enters you. Sound like the cross much? Or more recently, for music aficionados, maybe Leonard read Rumi, Leonard Cohn used to say in one of his songs, there is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Do we want to see? Amen. If you are able, would you please rise and join together in affirming our faith in the traditional words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father. Father. are found in the Book of Common Prayer, pray, page 387. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That, that we all may be one. one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That your that name, name may be glorified by all people. We pray especially for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, 
Michael, our presiding bishop, and for Kevin, our bishop, and for all priests and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for Joe, our president, and John, our governor, and all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. We pray especially for Chris, Louis, Leonard, Tom, Melissa, Joanne, Bill, Lisa, Abigail, Alex, those serving in the armed forces, and those who are homebound. Give to the departed, especially Robert, eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. In our diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for St. Barnabas Church. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, through the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. I have several announcements to make, so you're going to have to put your seatbelt on. Uh, first of all, our most popular coffee hour is happening today, thanks to Andrea Trebelsi. In the lounge, there will be coffee and some cookies, the lounge between the choir room and the conference room. Um, so I hope you'll enjoy warming yourself up after the service. Also, uh, on Sunday, October 31st, the Feast of All Saints will be observed during the services. So please read, read this paragraph right here. It's, uh, by Wednesday, October 27th, you can submit to the office names of those who have passed away that you would like to have not acknowledged uh, on that Sunday. And uh, you can also bring pictures of those who have passed and set them on the ushers' tables. So something very nice and all, lastly it's about the bazaar finally we're finally getting our announcement out on the bazaar and you'll see there are two pages of stuff to read about it <laughs> please for your homework assignment go home and read these two pages so that I don't have to go through it all but basically it's about we are going to have white elephants we're going to want you to bring your wonderful things 
um, the dates of when we are accepting those things are on this sheet. And you'll, you'll also in the e-news, I believe it'll be in there too. Uh, and also just to tell you about um, what we're going to, our, our vision, uh, Joanne and Figliola and our vision for the bazaar is this year, no sit down lunch, but we will have the takeout chili and soup. And we, uh, we're gonna have lentil soup uh, this year, a, a vegetarian option with, and then chili with meat. Um, and then also, uh, uh, we're not going to have the outside vendors come. Um, but other than that, we'll still have crafts and baked goods and, and more white elephants. And of course, Linda Hardy's incredible jewelry, thanks to you folks do donating your jewelry. So um, also, uh, there's a little confusion in here. We're gonna have a cookie walk, but it won't be the cookie walk. It'll be boxes of assorted, cookies and we want you guys to go ahead and start baking cookies and putting them in the freezer. But uh, Leslie Walker says no nuts and only a few people will be designated to make chocolate chip cookies, all right? But as far as the regular baked goods table, you can make baked goods, you can put nuts in those as long as you label what nuts are in there so that nobody gets sick. Um, so. Please, again, read all this information, put it on your refrigerator or something, get ready, mark December 4th, uh, two to, um, oh no, 10 to two, or nine to two, sorry, in your, um, so that's it for, the, for our long announcement. Thank you, any other announcements? Oh. Ladies luncheon on November 1st at, at Tyler's, which is on Limestone Road. Okay, so there's a covered over porch where you get, to, so you, those of you who, who wanna eat outside, it'll be covered over, but it'll be heated as well. So that's it. Ascribe to the Lord the honor to his name, bring offerings.
Continuing with Eucharistic prayer B. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation by him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, Father who Lord art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us.
the gifts of God for the people of God. and place our pride in the name of our God. We shall rejoice in your salvation and place our pride in the name of our God. May the Lord answer you in time of trial. May the name of Jacob's God protect you. We shall rejoice in your salvation and place our pride in the name of our God. May he send you help from the holy place and give you support from Zion. We shall rejoice in your salvation and place our pride in the name of our God. May he remember all your offerings and receive your sacrifice with favor. saves his anointed and the end
answers from his holy heaven with the mighty victory of his hand. Some put their trust in chariots or horses, but we in the name of the Lord, our God. We shall rejoice in your salvation and place our pride in the name of our God. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, let us now to do the work you have given us to do to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Remember that you are not who you think you are. You are more than that. You are eternally and unconditionally beloved sons and daughters of God. And may the peace, love, and joy of our ever-loving God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you, and remain with you now and forever. Amen.
in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia.